My Bible's missing. <laughs> I, I might just need that. I thought I had it up here. Um, it might be in my office on my desk. I think Troy's going to grab it. Hopefully he is. Um, well, I'll, I'll just say this while he's running back there. I'll always have your Bible handy, by the way, but um, that's not what I was going to say. Uh, I'm just grateful for the, for the church we have, for the church God has brought together. The Bible says God builds a church, right? Uh, Psalms tells us that, uh, that you know, it's, it, it doesn't do us any good to, to, to build the church. It's, uh, I'll be honest, you don't, call a, you don't call a paramedic to build your house. You call a carpenter. If you call a paramedic to build your house, you'd get what would happen if I built your house and it would not be livable. It's not there. I, if, if check a yeah, yeah. We, down there, they had this guy that preached. There, like he had like no. I, I I thought I brought it up here and set it down. One of the kids probably ran off with it. I have an extra Bible in my office, Jess. If, if, if it, it's on the it's on the shelf. Um, it, it'll be weird preaching from that, by the way. Um, but uh, yeah, it's... I don't remember what I was saying now. This has thrown me all off. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. You, don't want to, you don't want to build a paramedic to build your house because, you know, if the paramedic builds your house, it's going to fall down around your ears. In fact, you'll never actually... <laughs> Everybody turn to... That's the wrong verse. Uh, oh, we found it. Where did I leave it? On the, in the kitchen. All right. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, you, you don't want the, the, the paramedic building your house. You want, you want a, a carpenter. You want a, uh, somebody who, who knows how to build uh, uh, your, your home. Otherwise, um, it's not worth living in, and it'll crumble down around your ears. Um, the Bible tells us that unless God builds a house, right, we're going to talk about the church. We, we could have... Thousands of people. Well, we couldn't have thousands of people in here. It wouldn't fit everybody in here. We could have every seat filled in standing room only. In fact, not even standing room. And everybody would be excited and glad to be here. But if we build it in the wrong way, if we don't have the people that God has, has fitly joined uh, to this body, uh, it'd be like having uh, a body with six eyeballs and four arms and, and three legs. Right? God, God will put together the church he wants to. And I just want to, want to say I'm thankful for the, God, the church that God is building. Um, you know, we may not be um, growing by leaps and bounds. We're growing as God builds us. Amen. It's and that's what that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and and I, I'm thankful for that. Um, last week we we started into our study on financial freedom. Uh, we looked at three things. There are three aims of financial freedom. And when we talked about what financial freedom was, it is not. Uh, we want to be very clear on this. It is not to have as much money as you can in the bank or to have as many toys in your garage or to have a big garage. Uh, that is not the aim of, of having the financial freedom. It isn't so that we can do whatever we want and live it up and have a great time. We talked about the, the difference between being rich and then being rich towards God and our desire, our motive should be to be rich towards God. Uh, that doesn't mean that having money is wrong. Uh, there were rich men in the Bible and uh, they were rich godly men in the Bible. Paul said, I know both how to be abased and to abound. Uh, and we're, and, and the, the idea is that whichever place we find ourselves, whether with a lot or a little, uh, we're content. And uh, so the aim is to be rich towards God. Our desire should not be to build up a bank account, but it should be more importantly to build up our riches and our wealth in heaven. Uh, our, our, our looking at those eternal things instead of those uh, material, tempor temporary things. Uh, the second goal we're, we, we looked at last week was to be content. I already kind of mentioned it. Reg regardless of where we find ourselves, we need to learn to be content. We found in Philippians 4.11, Paul learned to be content in whatever state he was. It's important that we learn this. It's, a, it's something that we all have to learn. Um, uh, it, it's not something we're born with or we, we grow up with. It's, it's something that uh, the Holy Spirit sometimes has to teach us. Um, the third thing we looked at is, uh, the third goal is to be debt free. Uh, we looked at uh, the, the, the word of God and there is, no, there is no command not to have debt. In fact, if we looked at, we looked at Psalms 37 verse 21, and it says, the, the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. 
If it just stopped where it says the wicked borroweth, then, we, then that would imply that we shouldn't be borrowing. Uh, but that's not what it says. It says the, the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. That, that implies that it, uh, the righteous person can borrow, but as, and as long as we pay back. And the truth is, we live in a day and an age, it's really hard to live without some kind of debt. You, you can't have a, a house anymore unless you have hundreds of thousands of dollars just laying around. And I don't know anybody... I don't personally know anybody with hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around. I don't think I do. If they do, they're hiding it very well, and that's fine. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to know what people have for money. Uh, it's, uh, but we don't have that. Don't, many people don't have $30,000 to buy a car in cash. Uh, it, it's be something we can strive for, that we can try to, to save money for, and that's okay. Uh, but, but many times we have to take out loans. And uh, the, the idea, though, is that we're able to pay back those things. And, and, but there were some principles we looked at. And one is that the, that the servant is always, uh, or the, that the uh, borrower was always servant to the lender. That was found in, we found that in Proverbs 22, 7. And the idea is that if, if I am always serving, uh, if I'm always working to be able to pay back uh, the person that I owe all my money to, uh, or all the money I'm earning to, then I'm not unable to help others. I'm unable to do anything other than to continue to work to pay off my debt. And the, and the idea is that we should never put ourselves into that position. Um, Romans 13, 8 tells us that we're not to owe any man anything. It's, it's speaking specifically of the believer's obligation to love his neighbor. Uh, but the, the idea is it's good to not owe other people, uh, uh, owe other people money. Now, those are the three aims we talked about last week. This week we're going to look at things that, that come up in our lives or, or in our flesh that can cause us uh, to stumble in these areas. Right? There, there, listen, it, it, there are sins of the flesh that will cause us to make it hard for us to live a financially free life. Uh, we're going to, and we're going to look at, I believe there, there are ten of those. And the first one is this, it's covetousness. Covetousness. Look with me at Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. If you don't, if you're not able to keep up with all the, with all the scripture, you can cheat like I do and use a, use a, use an electronic uh, device to turn or you can write them down. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. If, if, if we looked up all these things, we wouldn't make it through half of it before, uh, before we were done. It says, verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservants, nor his maidservants, nor his oxen, nor his ass, nor anything that is his neighbor's. Uh, look over uh, Joshua chapter 7, verse 21. The idea is that we've been commanded not to covet. Joshua chapter 7, verse 21. It says, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold of 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Achan as he's speaking to Joshua. Uh, he has, uh, they were commanded not to touch of any of the, uh, the spoil from, from uh, Jericho. Uh, it was all to be given unto the Lord. Uh, Achan saw it. He desired it, and then he took it. Uh, covetous, he saw it and he coveted it. That, that the the uh, idea or the, the, what covetousness is, it's, it's the, that desire that, that causes us to want things that do not belong to us or that are not for us and not intended for us to have. And that was, that was a problem here. It caused a massive problem for the people of Israel. Uh, uh, the sin of covetousness uh, caused the people of Israel, and it didn't just affect Achan and his family, which it did. It didn't just affect Achan; it affected his his chi- his wife, his children, uh, his uh, all of the all of the, their servants. It affected the people of Israel, and the twenty six of them lost their lives in the battle against Ai. Uh, covetousness is a very serious problem. Uh, look at, with me to Second Timothy chapter three, verse one and two. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I, 
and pop-up apps that come up on your phone and block the, the, the words where we go, most blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Uh, uh, even in the last days, they're still going to be dealing with this idea of covetousness. It's not something that just happened in the Old Testament. It's not something that was just on the part of the, the Ten Commandments. It's something that we deal with on a, a daily basis. It's, it's, it's part of our flesh uh, that will rise up. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 and 22. Uh, you can go ahead and turn there. This tells us it's a problem of our heart. It's a problem of our heart. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, that's not the right, that's what I told you, but it's not the right verse. Mark chapter 7, not Matthew chapter 7. Mark, Mark chapter 7, 21 through 22. says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murderers, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, and blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Uh, understand that, that covetousness is one of the, 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 the problems of the heart. The Bible tells us the heart is wicked and is deceitfully wicked who can know it uh, uh, we may look good on the outside we may look like we have it all together that we're the the righteous and the holy and the and uh, let's let's follow that guy in here where you and i can't see uh can be dark and wicked and evil the pharisees were just that type of person right the, uh, they, they had everything right on the outside but their hearts were were, were wicked and deceitful and jesus described them as as uh, whited sepulchers uh they were they look good on the outside but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones uh, covetousness is a sin of the heart it's a sin of the heart uh we need to be very careful luke chapter 12 15 you don't have to turn there but it, jesus instructs us to beware uh, of the of the sin of covetousness that tells me something. It's a real danger for every believer. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're immune to sin. We all know this. We're not immune to the sin of the heart. Uh, so so if, if Jesus told the disciples to beware of covetousness, uh, we need to beware of it ourselves. Listen, I know Peter had a big mouth, um, but I'm no Peter. You know, uh, the, the, uh, the disciples were... The men that God used to change the world and turn it upside down. And he told them to be careful of it. We need to be very careful of, of covetousness. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. God here, in, Paul here in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 um, compares covetousness to something else. Look at Ephesians 5 first. Well, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as it becometh saints. Now look over at Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. It's, 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 when you take, it's when you take whatever it is, whatever it is you're coveting, whether it's a I, I personally like cars, I like motorcycles, I like things with wheels and big engines that make loud noises and, and black marks on the pavement when I, when I, when I either do the throttle or, or push on the, on the pedal. I like those types of things. I could become covetous over something like that. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's when I have a desire over that that causes me to place that object, that temporary, worth, really in all honesty, worthless thing in the place of God. Idolatry, covetousness. We need to be very careful and very wary of it. I had to sell my motorcycle. I was sad. But I'd rather not have my motorcycle and have the Lord, amen? It's a whole lot better. I'd end up killing myself on the motorcycle. Or, you know, getting a ticket. Look over at, uh, at Ephesians 5 again. Ephesians 5, we're going to look at verse 3 this time. It says, but fornication, all uncleanness, all covetousness, let it be once named among you, as become the saints. Uh, we were supposed to look at verse 5 earlier, which also says it's, it's, that that person is an idolater. Uh, look also with me to Hebrews chapter, where are my notes? Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5. 
It says this, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For as he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The idea here is that in the, in the heart and the life of the Christian, there should be no covetousness. There should be no covetousness. Uh, we shouldn't, this, it should be something that we put away from ourselves. And as far as the qualifications of a pastor, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, uh, pastors are not to be covetous. I, I, I do want to say this, pastors are to be held to a, to a very high standard, but it is no higher than the standard that every Christian is to be held to. But if, you don't stay, if, you, if you're not able to hold up to that standard, you, you, don't, you don't fit as, you're, you're not fit for the, the office of, of leadership. But if you read down through the list, everything the pastor is to be is everything the child of God is supposed to be. It's, there, should be there should be no difference. Second Timothy, uh, sorry, Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter 2. We're going to look at a couple of verses here. Verses, four, verses 3 and verse 14. Verse 3 says this, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And jump down to verse 15, 14. It says this, Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Who is this talking about? The context is it's talking about false teachers. So uh, understand that if you have uh, a, a pastor who is covetous, it's a sign of uh, a false teacher. Now that doesn't mean that every pastor who struggles with sin is, or every Christian is, is a false, that, that struggles with covetousness is a false teacher, but it is a sign that, uh, of, of false It's a symptom uh, of the problem. The problem is the heart of those false teachers. But we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful of them. Go back to Colossians chapter 3. Verse 2, so set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for you're dead and your life is here with Christ and God. Set your affections on things, uh, set your affections on things above, that's th talking about eternal things. Uh, the, 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 set your affection on the, the things of God and not on the things of the, the earth. This is a command for every Christian. The problem is, many times we, we as Christians can't differentiate the things that we need and the things that we want. Right? Uh, if, if our focus, though, is on the things of God, if our focus uh, is on uh, the things uh, that, that, that bring honor and glory to Him, and then what's the, the Bible says, that, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If our focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ, if our focus is on eternity and those things, uh, the Bible says that, that God will take care of all those other things. And it, it will help us to clarify what's a need and a want. Because the truth is, there are certain things that we have that we would say, I need this. But it's not a need. It's a want. One of these things I have is right here. I need this. I, I have convinced myself that I need this phone. So much so that I will pay a monthly bill, for one for me and one for my wife. Now that's a lot of money. For, the, for our two phones. I need this. Now there are sometimes, there are some people that will, will need it and it's good to have a, a, a way of, to communicate and things and, 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 I, and, and you might use it for your job or, or those things and there are times when it is necessary but this thing does a whole lot of things that I don't need. I don't necessarily need this one and I won't necessarily need the very next one that comes out. Well that's, that's just it. That's what we're talking about, right? Because if, if you want to go to upgrade, well, it's going to be, you're signing yourself up for another two-year contract, and we'll give it to you for this much money, and that's a lot of money you're tying up on a piece of equipment. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a phone. I'm not saying, uh, I use this for study. Uh, I, I, when I, there, I have the strong coordinates on here. It is a whole lot easier to push a button to tap the screen than to flip through the pages. But I have a strong coordinates in my office as well. Uh, it's, it, it, it's not as portable as this is, <laughs> but I understand we, we, we need so much in, this, in our country, in our, in our culture, but you would go over to some third world country and 
they would laugh us to scorn because of the things that... They do, but they, they struggle with covetousness too. What do we really need? And that, that, that has to be something that we, we seek the Lord for. I'm not going to tell Troy what Troy needs, right? I'm not going to tell him, Troy, what, what he should spend his money on. That's none of my business. I am my business. My family is my business. And so I need to take a, a proactive look at the things that, that I do. And, 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 and listen, if I can't feed my family, but I'm spending $60 a, a month on cable, there's a problem. If I, can't, if I can't take care of this, but I can do this because I like, the, I like Dunkin' Donuts coffee. There's nothing wrong with drinking Dunkin' Donuts coffee. But I need to take a hard look at, do I need Dunkin' Donuts coffee? Because it costs $3. My wife's like, no, you do not. Hey, Amy, Amy McCullough, where are you? Yes, I do, right? <laughs> we, were, we were talking about needing coffee earlier. She's like, I need it. Actually, she looked at me funny because I said I didn't actually drink it, need it at one point. But anyway, so the idea, though, is we have to look at, at what it is that we have. And if, if our focus is the temporary things... Uh, on this earth, man, there are things, I need, I need that, I need this, I need, uh, I need those heated leather seats that, that, that will, you know, I, I need this and I need that. And, and I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. What I'm saying is if, if we're robbing God to pat our pockets, then there's a problem. If we're neglecting our family to, 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 to have a more comfortable uh, entertainment system, a bigger, bigger TV, there's a problem. If, if we're going to neglect the church or neglect other brothers and sisters in Christ, that we should be able to help. Because God gives us enough to, to take care of us and to help others, or he gives others enough to, to help us. It, 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 it kind of, it's full circle, right? It's sometimes uh, we help others when we have extra, they help us. When, when they, listen, that, that's how God intended it to be. But we get our so, ourselves so strapped and so tied up because of a desire for something more that we get, we get these toys that we're stuck paying for. And we can pay for them. We're not in sin. But the sin is, the, the problem comes in when we can't do other things. And now I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not telling, I'm not looking at anybody's bank accounts. I, I, I don't have that access. I don't know who tithes. I, I don't know any of that. I, I'm not preaching at anybody. What I'm saying is that I, I'm preaching at everybody. The truth is that we need to be able to be step away from the covetousness, to set our eyes on Christ, and really get a good focus on what's truly important. Because if we can't, we're limiting the blessings of God in our own life, and we're limiting how God can bless others through us. And we're not being good stewards of his money, because it's his in the first place. Covetousness. We've got ten of these. I don't think we're going to get through them all. <laughs> what time is it? 2.48. Oh, goodness. All right. Second is this. The love of money. The love of money. The desire to be materially rich. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 6 through 10. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. What do you say we're supposed to be content with? Food and raiment. I don't even see a roof over my head. I would think that's a necessity. I would want that as a necessity. But he says, if having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into, into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Did you catch that? The love of money has caught many to err from the faith. They, they had a love for money so great that it caused them to step away from their, their faith and their trust in the almighty, all-fulfilling uh, one who died to save their sins. It's the root of all evil. Verse, verse, uh, verse uh, 17 here. Uh, we're going to look at two verses. Verse 17 and uh, then back again at verse 9. Verse 17. Where am I at? 
Verse 17 says this. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who give, giveth us richly all things to enjoy. It, that tells us it's not a sin to be rich in this world. There is there's no sin in having wealth. The sin is in the love of that wealth or the love of money. Go back to verse 9. It says, it says but they that we rich fall into temptation. The, the, the problem is that, that will be. That's what that tells you. They're not content where they're at. They, they always want more. And the truth is, uh, those that are, are dealing with covetousness, this, this love of money, they can never get enough. Do you realize how much money some people have in the bank? And what do they do? They're investing and, and trying to make more and more. Again, no, no sin in being rich. And, no, and there's no sin in having a retirement. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, in fact, the Bible, it's wise to, to be able to put enough money away that you can give to your children. Uh, uh, Isaac did that. He gave his sons a blessing and, and, and gave them wealth. There's no, there's no sin in, in, in that. The, the sin is when you, it's, again, it's just that love of money that drives you to get more and more and more and you never satisfy that hunger never there are people that have more cars than they could drive in a year Jay Leno, uh, 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 he's got a, a show, uh, uh, Leno, Leno's Garage, uh, uh, and, and he's got all kinds of amazing, I, I am jealous, I am covetous of his car. I'm not really, I wouldn't, I'm not idolizing, I wouldn't take them, but he's got some really nice cars. I, a, a beautiful, uh, unique uh, cars that he goes out and he, he can drive. He can drive a different car every day of the week and never touch all of his cars. I don't know how many he has, but it's, well, it's, it's near 100, if not more. It's his money, and, and honestly, he's a lost person. I, I don't expect him to not, to not, I'm not telling. I met a man here not too long ago, this last summer actually, who lived in this area who had 60, uh, he, he had several hundred thousand dollars worth of antique cars. He got saved, and God convicted him about all those cars he had sitting in his garage. And you know what he did? He sold them all and went out and bought Bibles, and he travels around the country and, and asking, asking stores, hey, can I put these here free for the taking? He went through one car, and when he ran out of Bible, so he didn't need more money, he sold the next car. And he did that to the next car, until he didn't have any more cars left. Praise God. I would struggle with that. That's my car! <laughs> right? I don't want to, but listen, that's the, that's the perspective we should have. The love of money, the love of money will cause destruction. Again, in verse, in verse, verse 10. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have err from the faith, have pierced themselves with many sorrows. It just brings about sorrow. When all of our, when all of our, our hope is tied up in, in, in things that are temporary, the truth is, one, that we'll never be satisfied with what we have, but two, it can all be gone in a flash. And when it's gone, what do we have? Absolutely nothing. And with more money comes more problems, just to be honest with you. Have you ever heard of a, a, one of those stories? Uh, there used to be a TV show that would follow um, on TLC. Uh, uh, it, uh, there used to be a TV show that would follow these people who won multi-million dollars from the lot lottery. Um, I, don't, I don't play the lottery. Uh, but it, they, they'd won millions and millions and millions of dollars on, on the lottery. And... They'd follow through, and none of them were happy. In fact, most of them were broke after several years because what happened is people would call up and, hey, Uncle George, twice removed, and once I talked to you, I think, back in 1932, right? Everybody comes out looking for money and uh, poor investments. People come and f take steal money. Listen, it, it just it, it isn't worth it. The love of money is the root of all evil. Earl has texted me to tell me that Jay Leno has 138 cars, so... <laughs> <laughs> He's watching from home. Uh, that's, that's a lot of cars. He could share. I could take one. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, yes, that's it. I, I just want it so I could sell it after driving it. I could drive it to hand out the tracks. I'm kidding. 
Oh, goodness. I'm trying to justify my own covetousness. I tell you, I'm horrible. <laughs> uh, take, take your Bibles and turn over to, to Psalm chapter 62. Apparently, he also has 90 motorcycles. Now, he, I just don't like him anymore. I'm kidding. Earl's, Earl's still texting me. Normally, my phone's put away, so when he texts me during the messages, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, 6210 says, Trust not in oppression, and become not in vain in robbery. If in riches increase, sit not your heart upon them. Uh, the, the truth is, we sh- our hearts should not be set upon uh, the finances. Uh, it's all vain. It is all vain. Now, th- that doesn't mean we don't need money, right? If you go to the grocery store, you need to be able to pay. When, when, when uh, your heating bill comes in, you, you, it's okay to, to, to have money. Money is necessary, and, and money isn't the evil. It's that love of money, that love of money. It is 2.56. I think we've got time to cover one more. We'll see. Third one, Greed. Greed is the inordinate desire for more than we need. An inordinate desire for more than we need. Turn to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 16. Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. Not a very pretty picture. Proverbs 25, 16. Did I give, give you guys the right? I read the right one. Uh, Proverbs 25, 16. Hast thou found honey? Eat as much as is sufficient for thee. It's the, it, greed is, is, the, is the wanting of more than I need. Right? It's, it's that uh, instead of just getting what's sufficient for me, it's the continually hoarding to myself. Now the idea here, the picture that, that Solomon gives to us is a really disgusting one. Uh, think of a man sitting there with a bowl, uh, uh, I think of Winnie the Pooh, really. <laughs> Dipping his pie in, eating as much honey, until he's all done, oh, complaining about his belly, uh, and, and making himself sick. When I was, how old was I when, with, with the corn? I was, I, I was missing these two front teeth, so I was young. I was like seven years old, seven or eight years old. I was about Hannah or Ezra's age. And uh, we had corn on the cob. We had a bunch of family and friends come from church to, to the house. And we had a big, big cook. My mom, my mom cooked, boiled a bunch of corn, fresh corn on the cob. How many years was it that I ate? 17 or 18, I think. I ate what was sufficient for me. And then some. And I found out exactly what happens when you eat too much corn or anything else. That night I went to bed and I laid down in bed and I sat up and I puked corn everywhere. It was, it was awful. Sorry, Marge. The, the picture, it, I, could not sm- I could not stand the smell of corn for years. I would walk into the house, my mom would be cooking corn and I would, I would go vomit because it was so, not the corn is bad, I can eat it now, but that was, that was like 30 years ago. It took me probably 15 years before I could even stand the smell of it, uh, to sit at the table where it was cooked. It was, uh, but that's what greed does to us, right? Greed causes us to, to, to we got more than, uh, enough, but now I want more. And I want more and more. Listen, this is an issue. An issue. It's a problem of not being satisfied. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. It says, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Uh, when, when we're struggling with the sin of greed or, or this dissatisfaction, uh, uh, it doesn't matter what we have, we're always going to want more. It doesn't matter that our needs are filled. It doesn't matter that our bills are paid. It doesn't matter that, that uh, everything is taken care of. Uh, what... what there's, a, there's a, an emptiness, a, 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 something, a desire for more that, that, that wants to be filled. And, and the truth is that can cause sin. That can cause sin. First Kings chapter 21, uh, you don't have to turn there. This is the story of, of Ahab and, and, and uh, the vineyard. 
uh, uh, Naboth's vineyard. Uh, Ahab uh, looked out his window and he saw this vineyard. He wanted this vineyard and he tried to go and buy the vineyard. And Naboth said, no, it's been in my family all my life. And I, 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 I can't sell this vineyard. It's, 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 it's my inheritance. And Ahab went and pouted in his bedroom. And Jezebel came in and said, aren't you the king? Just go, just go, just go take it from him. And, and pretty much so what they, what they did was they paid people to lie about Naboth. And, and uh, Naboth was, was killed. And suddenly there's a free vineyard you could buy. <laughs> Where did that come from? Sin. Where did that sin come from? That, that, that was, it was greed. It was greed. Second Kings chapter 5. Again, you don't have to turn there. But uh, we have the story of Gehazi. Uh, uh, the uh, is it Naaman it comes to it comes to Elisha for healing. He has leprosy. The little the little his little servant girl had had said that the, there was a man of God that could heal him. He came to him looking for some great healing and got uh, and and uh, Elisha uh, didn't even come out to, uh, to 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 deal with him. Said no, just. Uh, Sent the Gehazi out and said, "Just go wash in the Jordan River." He's upset. Uh, goes away and ends up coming back and, and goes and washes and, and God blessed and he was he was cleansed and he was so thankful that he says to he says to the prophet, "Listen, I've got all of this money and all of these clothes and here you can have it all as a reward for what you've done." And he says, "I don't want it. Go away." And he went away and Gehazi said, "I could get some of that." In his greed. He followed after. He lied to, to Naaman, and, and, and uh, Naaman gave him uh, of, the, of the clothes. And he, says, he had said, Elisha said, uh, he changed his mind. The prophet changed his mind. Here, I'll take it back to him for you. You don't even have to come back. And he went, and when he went back, the Lord told Elisha what, what he had done. And Gehazi, the servant, a man full of greed, was now a man full of leprosy. The same leprosy that, that, uh, that Naaman had had. It causes problems. It causes Gehazi to be cursed. It causes sin in our lives. Greed brings trouble into a home. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 27. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 27. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. But he that hateth gifts shall live. He that is greedy troubleth his own house. Think about the trouble that can cause in your home. It's Satan doesn't need any help, right? It's Satan, it is Satan has his tools and his ways, and, and listen, it, it, Satan doesn't need us to open up the door and let him in. It. it homes are being destroyed left and right, outside of the church and inside of the church. We don't need to open the door and say, come on in, Satan, here, have a seat right here. Hey, that's what we do when we're, when we're, we're bringing this, these sins into our homes because our, our sin affects our family. And what, 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 what's scary is what, what the things that I allow, my kids will embrace because I allowed it. And that will affect them and their children and, and generations down the line if, if the Lord tarries and doesn't come back. Uh, but un, un, understand, uh, man, it will affect and trouble and dis- destroy your home if you let it. That's true with any sin. But of greed as well. Is that clock right? All right, I got time for one more. Greed that is the last one we just did. Envy. Envy. Maybe two, because this one's short. What is envy? It's a resentment over, over what others have. Talk, take your Bibles and turn to Psalms chapter 73. I love this passage of Scripture. One, because... I'm actually going to turn to it in my Bible. We may just stop and stay here. Psalm chapter 73. Here we have a, a, a psalm written by a man named Asaph. 
many times people think that David wrote all the, all the Psalms. He did not write all of the Psalms. Asaph was a uh, was was a man of God. He was uh, in charge of the music in the temple. Um, uh, but uh, here he wrote this Psalm. It says, it "Starts out truly, God is good to Israel, even to such or as of a clean heart." Uh, and the truth is, God is good, isn't He? God is very good to us, but the problem is sometimes we take our eyes off of that. He says, but as for me, it's Asaph speaking, my feet were almost gone and my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish which I saw the, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph, a, a man of God, a man who God used to write part of, part of the word of God, a man who, who served in the temple, who, served, who, who was the, in charge of the, 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 the ministry of music in the temple. This was, this was a man mightily used of God in, in, in those days. And, and he said, my feet have well nigh slipped uh, because I was envious. We are not immune just because of our position. We are not immune just because we believe in Christ. We can fall into this stuff just like anybody else can. His problem was he was envious at the wealth of the wicked. He saw the prosperity of the wicked and he saw the troubles he was going through. And he says, this isn't fair. Don't you hear that a lot? I got kids, I hear it all the time. That's not fair. I had that first. I want that. That's mine. The kids are always fighting over toys. It's not fair. They're envious of one another. We can do the same things as adults. Now, we, not may, we may not throw a tantrum or, or cry out loud, but in our, in our hearts, our eyes get off of the goodness of God to his people, and we think, oh, but look at the wicked, and look at, look at the prosperity. And listen, we look around, the, the wicked around us are, are prosperous. Look at Hollywood. And the mess, and the, the mess, the, don't, look, don't watch the things that they, that they make over there. There's a lot of mess out there and that should never be seen by anybody. But, but, but look at the, the wealth that comes from that. There are some truly wicked people that have more than I'll ever have. And I could look at that and say, that's not fair. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I serve God. Why doesn't God bless me like that? And that's what happened here to, to Asaph. He, he, his eyes, he took his eyes off the Lord and the goodness of God in his own life and began to look at the, 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 the problems. And, it, and this, it caused some issues. He, look at verse, uh, we're going to start in verse uh, 5. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as, as a gar, in the garment. Verse 9, they set their mouth against the heavens and their tongues walketh through the earth. Look at the pride of those people. They, uh, they're living in their wickedness and they're, they're, they're in their prosperity and they're proud. It's just, not, it's wrong. And I, here I am serving God, doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. And, and look at all the troubles that have befallen me. It's just not fair. Verse 7 and 10, he talks about their provision. It says, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. Verse 10, therefore that his people were turned hither and waters, are, 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 and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. He says that they've got everything. They're, they're, they're so fat their eyes are bulging out. That's a, a, the fatness was a sign of prosperity back in, in, in those days. It, it, nowadays, it's, everybody's you know, wafer thin, and, and apparently back then I would have been rich. <laughs> Except for my eyes aren't bulging out. Uh, but he, he was upset because, uh, because of their provision and how God provided, or how they were being provided for. He was upset about their position. Verse 8, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Uh, uh, man, they had everything. They had all the power. Uh, he was upset about all of these things, envious of these things, but he forgot one thing, and I love this part of this chapter. Verse 14, he goes on to talk about his own issues. He says, or verse 13, he says, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He says, I, he says I've, I, I, I've, I've cleansed myself in vain. I, 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 I've tried to be righteous in vain and innocency. Uh, I've been plagued all day long and chastened in the mornings. It, it's just, it's, it, it's, it's bearing upon him. And he goes, and I can't speak, talk about it. If I speak thus, it'll offend others. It, uh, it, it's, just, it's, it's eating him up on the inside. Until I went into the sanctuary. 
Verse 17. Until I went into the, sanctuary of, into the sanctuary of God and then understood their end. See, he was, his, he was envious of the prosperity and the provision and the, the power and the position and all the good things that he thought they had. But he forgot about what the true goodness of God is. It isn't about our, our material wealth and it isn't about the, the things that we have or the bank account or the car that we drive or, or any of those other things. It's about the goodness of God to his people. And the truth is, I could live in a hut, in a hole in the wall somewhere out in the middle of nowhere with no electricity, no cell phone, and God can still be good to me. I just need to be content where I'm at. I can't be putting my eyes on everybody else and just keep my eyes on the Savior. And that will help me get through the envy and the greed and the covetousness that so easily besets Christians and brings brings about problems in our lives. Proverbs 14.30 talks about how envy is the rottenness of the bones. You don't have to turn there. You can write it down. Uh, it, it's a, it, there, was a, there was an issue there. Uh, you know, the, the rottenness of the bones. It's a, it, it had an interesting call years and years ago as a paramedic. Uh, this, this woman went outside. She was playing with her son. Um, she was 32. Uh, she was playing soccer with the son. And she went and she kicked the soccer ball. And her leg snapped. She had cancer, a tumor on the bone, and she didn't know it at the time. It's how, how she found out. They were able to actually, they were able to find and deal with the cancer surgically. And she didn't lose her leg, uh, but there's rottenness there, a weakness. Envy is a weakness, and it will eat us up on the inside. It will cause us to lose our strength and our ability to stand. It will cause us to feel broken and and empty. And uh, the truth is, it will destroy us internally. If we allow it to, but we don't have to allow it to. First Corinthians chapter 13. If we keep our eyes on the Lord, if our focus is on God, and if we love one another, we'll be able to overcome the envy. So, the Bible says in Verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Now, we're to love our neighbor. I'm to love my wife. I'm to love my neighbor. And I'm to love my enemy. I don't know who else there is out there. If you can come up with another, another group of people uh, that, 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 that I don't have to love, then, then, then show me. But uh, I'm supposed to love everybody. And the Bible tells me love, charity, envieth not. This love isn't the love that the world tries to portray. This love is the the love that God showed us. It's the love that God works through us. And if we truly love one another, we're not going to envy one another. We're not going to desire after. We're not going to be greedy or covetous of one another's things or positions or powers. The key to fighting off envy is to keep our eyes on Christ and to love one another. All right, we'll, we'll stop there. In our path to financial freedom, and, and, and the truth is, we are to be financially free. The principles of the Word of God teach us in how we're to be stewards of our money. And, and we'll get, I promise, we will get to all that. But if we don't deal with these things, if you don't deal with the sin and why we're to do it and then what can stop us from doing it, you can have all the, all, all the, all the things and take all the notes and you can, you can put all the principles in play, but the sin is still here, the sin of the heart, right? And what happens when you just change the outward but don't change the inward? You fall right back into it. You fall right back into it. So... Let's seek the Lord. Take a, just take a, take a good look at ourselves and, and ask God to show us if we fall short in any of these areas. Protect ourselves. And if we do, seek that we can have victory over it. Amen. I'm grateful that victory comes through Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for, for your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for, for, for the victory that we have through Christ. God, I pray you help us to be content with all that you've given to us. Uh, Lord, and, and Lord, content with what we have, not what we want to have or, 
or what we think we deserve. But Lord, I pray that you just help us to trust in you, to place our eyes upon uh, those eternal things, Lord, to place our eyes upon Christ and to, to not get so caught up in, in uh, the material things of this world. Lord, we thank you for, for your love for us. We thank you for, for, for Christ who died on the cross for us. Lord, if that's all that you've ever given to us, Lord, that was more than we deserved and, and, and definitely more than we, all that we needed. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.